We can also talk about different types of hypotheses. And again, this specifically came up in chapter one, so I'm just going to quickly review it again here. First is we talked about relational research and relational hypotheses. Here you would have two variables, a predictor and an outcome variable. And what we're interested in here is just the relationship between the two. Okay, so we might say something like higher socioeconomic status will be associated with lower incidence of maybe some sort of mental illness or whatever the case may be, some X behavior. So here all we're looking at is the relationship between the two, that as one goes up, socioeconomic status, the other one might go down, incidence of some behavior X. Okay, or that as one goes up, the other goes up. So here we're looking at a relationship between two variables without being able to say anything about cause and effect, whereas an experimental or causal hypothesis manipulates some variable at at least two different levels. Okay, so what we might have is a situation where people have control and don't have control, two different levels of some manipulated variable, and then what we do is to measure the outcome variable associated with each of those different levels. So when people have control over the situation, then what sort of satisfaction do they report? And when people don't have control over the situation, what sort of satisfaction do people report? Then what we're interested in doing is comparing the different uh, outcome variable levels. In other words, the outcome variable that's produced at each of the different levels that we've manipulated. And as we know, sometimes this uh, uh, manipulated variable isn't manipulated at all. Maybe it's something like gender, such as uh, a prediction or a hypothesis that men report higher rates of X than women. Stress, burnout, something like that maybe. Okay, now what you might notice here, and again, I know we've covered these concepts before, the blue shaded terms on the left-hand side here are typically what we've been referring to as the independent variables, and on the right-hand side in yellow as the dependent variables. Now for the relational hypotheses in particular, it's important to point this out, and it's, it's often difficult to identify which is the independent and which is the dependent variable in just a relational study. Okay? And in particular, it's not even always clear and it's not even very precise to say that one is the independent and dependent variable. But typically what we think about is if we're using one variable to predict another, if we're using loneliness, for example, to predict different levels of, uh, of humor styles in the study that, that we saw as homework and as our class activity, then because we're using loneliness to be the predictor, we might label that one as our independent variable and humor styles as our dependent variable in this situation. Now there's other ways to classify different types of hypotheses as well. And again, I just want to quickly go through these and make sure you guys understand the distinctions that we're going to make here. First is a directional hypothesis, and in particular, a directional versus a non-directional hypothesis. So if we think that there's going to be some effect of gender, we think men and women will be different on some sort of behavior, okay, in the way that they react to, to a breakup, okay, or the end of a romantic relationship then that's what we're going to be calling a non-directional hypothesis. So we're stating that men and women will be different, but we're not saying how or what direction this difference will take place. Whereas if instead we say that men will react more severely to uh, a, a romantic breakup, or that women will react more severely to a breakup, now what we're doing is making a claim about a specific direction that we should see. In other words, that the men will score higher or lower, such as it is. Okay, on whatever measure that we're using. So this is the difference between a directional and a non-directional hypothesis. A non-directional hypothesis simply states that we expect to see an effect of something like gender. And a directional hypothesis says specifically what direction we expect that variable to play a role. Okay? And in particular, which uh, with only two levels of the variable here, which order we expect to, to see things occur in. Now, moving beyond direction, we can also make predictions, and this is much less common in psychological science, about the magnitude that we expect to find. Okay, so whether we're expecting to find larger or smaller differences among multiple levels of some sort of variable. So we might give people, for example, uh, different uh, memory tests. Say memory is our dependent variable in which we're interested. Well, what we might do is present people with different types of words, okay, or non-words, different types of images, different types of things in general to remember. Let's say we give people um, concrete nouns like bird and plane and bike, abstract nouns like love, okay, as well as other words that aren't nouns. Okay, so they might be adjectives like happy. 
And then we also give people uh, pictures. Okay, so now we have four different types of, of material that we're presenting to people. Okay, then if we make specific claims about the ordering that we expect to find here and the magnitude of the differences we expect to find across all four of these different conditions, like the memory might be best for the pictures and then next best for the concrete nouns, which will be twice as good as the abstract nouns, which will be better than uh, the non-noun words. Okay, then what we're doing, as you can see, is making much more specific types of claims here. We're making claims about the order we expect things to be in, as well as the magnitude. Now, these are also going to be types of, uh, of hypotheses that we refer to as complex versus simple hypotheses. A simple hypothesis makes a claim about a single independent variable and how it affects a single dependent variable. But we can think of more complex hypotheses as well. And these are going to take into account multiple independent variables and how they affect dependent variables. So in particular here, what we're looking at is a simple hypothesis only includes a relationship between two variables, whereas a complex hypothesis takes into account multiple variables here. So three or more independent or dependent variables. We might make a claim about how the word type, but also the situation affects memory. Or we might make a claim about how word type affects not only memory, but also the reaction time or the ease with which people are able to recall the words. Those would be examples of complex hypotheses, as opposed to just the distinction between looking at uh, word type or stimulus type and memory. There we just have one independent variable and one dependent variable, so that would be an example of a simple hypothesis. Okay, finally, we're going to talk a little bit later down the road about statistical hypotheses, the null hypothesis, okay, with H sub zero, and the alternative or experimental hypothesis or research hypothesis, H sub one. Okay. Now, again, these are things that you're going to start seeing along the way, so I want to introduce the, these notions now, but we're going to explain these again in much more detail further down the road. Okay. where technically in science what we're doing, and this relates to uh, the waste and card selection task example we encountered uh, when I returned in week two, okay. is a lot of times what we're trying to do is to falsify or disprove things. We're trying to look for evidence against something rather than evidence for something. Well, similarly, when we statistically are testing our hypotheses, what we're actually doing is testing the null hypothesis, which is the presumption that there is no effect or that there is no relationship, okay? or that there is no causation between the different variables involved, okay? versus the hypothesis in which we truly believe, the one actually generated from our theory or our model, is the research or alternative hypothesis, H sub 1. You might have referred to this as H sub A in your Stats 261 course, depending on your instructor. And so thinking about hypothesis testing and revisiting what you may have done then in Stats 261, and again, we're going to cover this in a little bit more detail uh, further down the road, okay, when we talk about statistical hypothesis testing. In particular, the thing to, to recall here about hypothesis testing is, again, the logical foundation. And this, again, was talked about in Chapter 1 by Jackson. Okay? Now, there's two different types of logical reasoning, reasoning from general statements to specific or deductive reasoning. Okay, this is the type of reasoning that takes place when we're generating hypotheses from our theories. Because as I mentioned earlier, hypotheses or uh, theories are our general statements. And what we do is we try and generate specific testable hypotheses through deduction from our theory. Okay, now when we think about going the other way, inductive reasoning is looking at taking a series of specific findings and creating or generating or supporting a general statement there. This is where we might think about using uh, experimental research and research results to generate or develop hypotheses in the first place, or generate or develop theories, sorry, in the first place. Okay, so taking specific instances or taking specific results or the affirmation or uh, lack of support for specific hypotheses and how they might um, uh, provide support or lack thereof for the more general theory. Okay. Again, I mentioned that what we're actually doing statistically is what we refer to as null hypothesis testing. Again, how what we're actually going to be testing when we do hypothesis testing aren't, and I know this seems odd, they're not the, the, the experimental or research hypotheses that we truly believe in. But what we're actually doing is testing the, the, the complementary null hypothesis. That is the hypothesis that there is no effect 
or that there is no relationship. The other thing to keep in mind when we test hypotheses is the fact of replication or converging operations. And this speaks more broadly to the philosophy of science, where what we're thinking about here, okay, what's important here, is the fact that we're able to replicate the types of results that we have. Okay? Now, what does that really mean? This is part of, of, of the larger research cycle, where even though one single study might provide evidence against a hypothesis, that doesn't necessarily disprove the theory. Nobody's going to throw a theory out because one single study finds evidence that uh, is against hypotheses generated from that theory. Okay, it's important to be able to replicate and look across a variety of different studies okay, and, and develop a critical mass before we really start to rule out a theory or favor one theory over another. Okay, and furthermore, theories are dynamic in the sense that, that they will typically undergo revision and extension and occasionally, as uh, the philosopher Kuhn liked to call it, a revolution where you can think about a major or dramatic change uh, in the way that, that we think about things. So. Uh, the, 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 the shift from, a, um, uh, from an Earth-centered or a Ptolemy's notion right, of planetary motion in the universe, okay, being replaced by this Copernican heliocentric sun-centered notion okay, is a great example of the type of revolution that we're talking about here. So it does occur occasionally where one theory is just completely supplanted by, by what turns out to be a superior theory. But more often it's an incremental change, an extension uh, two current theories, a revision of existing theories that takes place in science. Okay? But either way, these general guiding principles, theories most broadly, the formal models uh, that we can reformulate theories into to give them a little bit more precision okay, and a little bit more quantitative predictive power, as well as the specific hypotheses that they generate, are really the guiding principles that we're going to be using and that you're going to see that are brought up in the research that you're encountering this semester.